Hey everybody, and Tony here with a review of Andrea Lorenzo Scartazzini's Edward der Zweite, which I saw at the Deutsche Oper Berlin. The conductor was Thomas Sondergort, the production was done by Christoph Loy, the sets were done by Annette Kurz, the costumes were done by Klaus Bruns, the lights were done by Stefan Bollega, the assistant director was Eva Maria Abelein, the chorus master was Raymond Hughes, and the dramaturgists were Ifona Gabawa and Dorothea Hartmann. Aside from being well known for trying to pacify Scotland along with his father, Edward II was equally well known for his passionate yet controversial affair with Pierce Gaveston. This was kind of debated if both of these men were either friends, blood brothers, or even more famously lovers. This also led to Queen Isabella of France to form an alliance with Roger Mortimer, leading Pierce Gaveston to be executed, and then we have the very infamous execution of King Edward II, where he is then poked in the you-know-where with a red hot rod. This story has been the subject of many playwrights, including Christopher Marlowe's Edward II, The Troublesome Reign and Lamentable Death of Edward II, King of England, with the tragical fall of Proud Mortimer, Ralph Hollinshed's Chronicles of England, Scotland, and Ireland, and Vita Edvardi, and there was even a film adaptation directed by Derek Jarman back in 1991, which not only chronicled the life of King Edward II, but also that of his affair with Pierce Gaveston. The opera does play a lot of these elements, but there are also a few elements that are added within the mix, like having an angel to console King Edward II, and having two gentlemen who serve as comic relief in what is otherwise a pretty heavy historical drama. And even though this opera is classified as a historical drama, there is a lot of black comedy thrown in the mix. There's no cream, no sugar in this type of comedy whatsoever. It's pitch black. Whether you have characters cussing left and right, or whether you have sexual innuendo, or even a few moments where some characters say something that is quite hilarious, even though it's one line, you'll find a lot of dark humor in this particular opera. I also like to mention something about the music, which is dissonantly nightmarish in a lot of occasions, mostly to heighten the dark and controversial aspects of King Edward II's life during his reign in England and his affair with Pierce Gaveston and his crumbling relationship with his wife and child, Queen Isabella and Edward III, respectively. And it's meant to really show all of these dark and controversial aspects in a way that's kind of frightening and almost really unsettling. But at the same time, it's almost mesmerizing as to how the music is being used, especially the usage of Zingspiel, in which the characters not only sing, but also speak to each other. And speaking of the characters, while I find them to be pretty one-dimensional, especially for historical drama, they have some few quirks here and there, most notably the two gentlemen that serve as the comic relief. And I also find the executioner to be quite threatening, especially when it comes to how he gets the job done in an instance. There are just a lot of interesting facets about this opera, even though I'm not a fan of the music, nor the story in general. But despite all that, it's still a very fun ride from beginning to end, and I certainly got a kick out of it, most notably in the black humor that was being used. And now we get to my thoughts on the production. Overall, I found it to be really stark and dark in a lot of places, and it was kind of eerie in almost a lot of places. In this production, there is a castle ruin combined with a lot of empty walls, which really heightens the fact that this was the time where King Edward II ruled, but now it's all in shambles. Here we have people dressed up in what they usually dressed up today, in a lot of civilian clothing, and coming in with a bride's gown as if though he came out from Lucia de Lamarbo's mad scene, 
was none other than Pierce Gavison, about to be wed to King Edward II. It was kind of strange, but okay, fine. This was not the only time that I've seen a gentleman dressed in drag. There was also an angel who comes in. He's quite muscular looking, but he's wearing an evening gown. And something rather interesting is that they didn't really use the original setting in which the story takes place, which is the 13th to 14th century England, but instead pretty much placing it within our time, especially when it comes to the posters and flyers of the community just bashing homosexuality, which was a relatively controversial topic back then, and to a lot of people, and even to a lot of cultures, is still a very tough topic to talk about today, mostly because of the content that is being used in this opera, and especially when it comes to the relationship between Edward and Gaveston. The overall production was rather interesting when it came to just getting the message across of just how dark the themes are and just how heavy they are. Though they managed to pepper the entire thing with a little bit of dark comedy, which managed to be some fun from time to time. Even though I would have loved to set everything in the 13th century just as the story was, the production overall is still quite interesting in how it was executed. And the costumes, though not absolutely striking, were actually pretty cool to look at, especially when it comes to Queen Isabella's costume before Pierce is executed, and I really love the different costumes that the two gentlemen wore for each scenario, whether they be guards or prison guards or counselors or even that of tour guides in a museum. So overall, while I am not a huge fan of this particular production, and even though some of the costumes didn't really strike me, I still have to give credit where credit is due, especially when it comes to just getting the atmosphere and the mood of what this opera was going to be. Whether you have characters cussing left and right, or whether you have a king going through a certain period of madness, or when the king has an illicit relationship with someone who is of his gender, it's still a pretty interesting production to look at, and it still has its few moments of brilliance here and there. And now we get to the singers, the very facet of this review I am very excited to talk about. Starting off with our main anti-hero, Edward II, was the superb German baritone Michael Nagy. Just by hearing this particular music and just by hearing this particular baritone sing the role of King Edward II, I have to say that his music and his style is quite comparable to that of Amfortas from Parsifal, Francesco from Imaz Nadieri, Carlo from Verdi's Hernani, and even to some extent Verdi's Rigoletto, mostly because you really need a superb singing actor to bring this character to life. And my goodness, did Michael Nagy did a fantastic job in bringing King Edward II to life. He not only brought his nobility and a little bit of his swagger to life, but he also brought his neurotic nature, his paranoia, and his sense of something really going wrong in his kingdom to life. One can tell that this is a king in constant torment. This is a king who is just mad with power and just wants everything to go his way. One can sense the crumbling psyche this king has, and I felt it. Even though this opera only lasted an hour and 30 minutes, I still felt his presence. I felt his crumbling psyche just coming down from his senses. It's just quite thrilling and fascinating, but at the same time, really unsettling. But you can't help but root for this character because he is a pretty messed up person. And I thought that Michael Nagy was a very superb singing actor. He was able to bring a sense of humanity to King Edward II despite his neurosis. 
and he did a very great job as a singer. And his voice just bloomed all throughout the evening. It is a wonderfully tuned, lyric dramatic, baritone voice. And he just seems to have a very great future in some of the heavier roles, whether they be Iago from Otello, Sharpless from Madama Butterfly, The Herald from Lohengrin, Beck Messer from Meistersinger from Nuremberg, Donna from Rheingold, and even that of Amfortas from Parsifal. I'm sure these are roles that will definitely suit Hernagi in the near future. Singing the role of his lover, Pierce Gaveston was the equally superb spinto tenor Ladislav Elger. What I notice about this role is that not only do you need the lyricism of an Alfredo Germont or a Faust or even that of a Belmonte, but you also need the spinto quality of a Polone, Hernani, Loge, Lohengrin, Walter von Stolzing, Erik from The Flying Dutchman, Cavaradossi, Ismaele from Nabucco, Arrigo from I Vespri Siciliani, and a lot of these other great roles for a spinto tenor. Oh, and lest I forget about Eleazar from La Juive, Robert Le Diable, Hold Nanchi, and even Sanson's hefty Helden Tenwa voice from Sanson's Sanso et Dalila. I thought Ladislav Elgar did a very great job in making Pierce Gaveston a dashing and noble figure, but at the same time, someone who can be a little bit on the giddy side. He was just a very fascinating singing actor, and his chemistry with Michael Nagy's King Edward II was extremely palpable. You could feel the fire and heat going on between these two men, and it is glorious. Not only was Ladislav Elgar a great actor with his great and commanding stage presence, but he was in total control of that fine spinto tenor voice. His high C's rang out like comets, and he really knew how to pace himself really, really well in terms of how he was going to go throughout the opera, and he was a very tactful musician, which was an absolute plus for Herr Elgar's side, and he did a very wonderful job embodying Pierce Gaveston. Then we have the spurned wife, Queen Isabella of France, sung with ferocious vivacity by the ever so wonderful Agneta Eichenholz. I consider this role to be a dramatic coloratura soprano role, much in the vein of other roles like Bellini's Norma, Elvira from I Puritani, Beatrice di Tenda, Semiramide, Matilde from Guillaume Tell, Amalia from Verdi's Imas Nadieri, Giovanna d'Arco also by Verdi, Elvira from Hernani, Violetta from La Traviata, Lucia di Lavermur, Anna Bolena, Maria Stuarda, Elisabetta from Roberto de Vereux, Marguerite de Valois from Les Huguenots, Antonia from Tales of Hoffman, and even to some extent Aitra from the Egetische Helena and Richard Strauss's Daphne. One really needs the quality of a true dramatic coloratura soprano and then combine that with a pure lyric soprano, thus making this role quite the marathon and she has a good deal of C sharps to sing. And my goodness, did Madame Eichenholz really pour herself in this role. She was able to make Queen Isabella not only a long-suffering wife and mother, but she was able to make her powerful in her own special way. She not only had glamour and style, but she had a very commanding stage presence, enough to keep my eyes glued to her and my buttocks glued to my seat. That was just how involving she was as an overall performer. She was really grand as Queen Isabella that my jaw practically dropped. 
That is just how committed she is as a singing actress. Then we get the two gentlemen who pretty much stole the show for me, Marcus Brook and Gideon Papa, who played four different roles, two guards, two museum curators, two prison guards, and even two gentlemen who seemed to really have the hots for each other. They were absolutely amazing as the comic relieves. With Marcus Brooks' gorgeously tuned, full-bodied Stradivarius of a dramatic baritone voice, and then you combine it with Gideon Papa's spirited, lively, light lyric tenor voice, and their voices blended superbly. The other singer who stole the show for me, at least in my opinion, was also Burkhard Ulrich, as the Archbishop Walter Langton. What I noticed about this role is that you really need a character tenor in the vein of Mime from Reingold and Siegfried, the captain from Wozzeck, and even to some extent Valzaki from Rosenkavalier, and even one of the Jews from Zalome to really sing this role. Not only does he have to prove himself to be a superb singer, but also an equally great character actor as well. And what more can I say about Herr Burkhard Ulrich? He was really, really superb in this particular role. His voice continues to have that focus and fine character tenor quality, and he was a very superb stage actor, making the best out of this really thankless part which requires a lot of great character singing, but at the same time, a lot of superb acting as he had to play along with the other singers of the evening, and he did a very magnificent job. James Krishik was calculatingly dangerous as the executioner Lightborn, helped with his superb light lyric tenor voice, his manner and ease. He was simply put a charismatic, and wonderful performer on stage. The way he was able to move around almost like a snake was so addicting to witness. He had everything in him. Great musicality, great theatricality, and an overall sense of really being the character and inhabiting him to the best of his abilities. But more than anything, he had wonderful charisma, which is an absolute plus for any singer. Then we also have Jarrett Ott singing the role of the angel, as opposed to King Edward II's more dramatic baritone tone. The angel does require a cavalier baritone who specializes in roles like the Count from Le Nozze di Figaro, and even to some extent Papageno from the Zauberflöte. And Jarrett Ott was really really handsome. He was a total heartthrob on stage. He had a fine build thanks to his well-defined features, his handsome countenance, and his equally rich lyric baritone voice. It's a really great combination and he had the fine physique de rôle to really fit the role of this handsome angel even though that dress, at least in my opinion, didn't really suit him well. If I were the costume designer, I would give him something a little bit more on the masculine side, like have him wear a suit of armor while still showing his arms and probably put him in a loincloth, at least in my opinion. I don't know. It just seems to be a better combination for someone as masculine virile, and extremely handsome like Mr. Rott. He not only had the build of a leading man with his muscular figure, but he had a very superb voice and an equally great future at that. I also have to give credit to Andrew Harris for doing a very great job in making Roger Mortimer a pretty menacing character. In terms of this character, you need a bass baritone voice who sings roles like Orest, Rochefort, and even that of Figaro from Le Nozze di Figaro. And Andrew Harris, what more can I say about this gentleman? He did an excellent job in embodying Mortimer. 
he was able to make him really virile, but at the same time, quite villainous in his schemes. He was just an absolutely great singing actor all throughout. And special kudos also has to go to Matis van Hasselt's innocent portrayal of Prince Edward and even Georgi Pucholsky's finely performed Spencer Jr. So overall, the singing found in this particular opera was exceptional. And the conducting done by Thomas Zundegort was really, really well done. He really paid attention to the text. And even though this type of music is not really my cup of tea, he's still able to handle the music with a sense of grace and a sense of tact. So overall, even though I am not a huge fan of Scarpazzini's music or a fan of this particular production all throughout, I still have to say that the artistic merit of the singers plus the conductor and the chorus and orchestra really shone throughout the evening. And for those of you who saw Scarpazzini's Edvard Dezweite, what did you think of it? Did you like this particular opera? Did you find something rather interesting about it? Or did you feel like this opera was not your cup of tea? Comment below and let me know. Well, that's all for now. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for my review of the Passion Concert, which will be shown at Bundesale. So until then, good night, everybody.